<sighs> Escape from Tarkov is arguably the greatest first-person shooter ever made. I should probably clarify that last bit there because technically it hasn't been made yet. It's not done. It's in the beta stage currently and we admittedly aren't quite sure when it will be, if ever, done in the same way that any of our favorite games over the years have been. The development of Escape from Tarkov has been in the public eye to varying degrees for nearly seven years now. Many folks, myself included, have been fortunate enough to have been a part of the development of the game throughout large portions of its history. For a fortunate few, myself included, this game has literally changed our lives. And throughout the years, the game itself has changed nearly as much. The goal of this video is to document the significant milestones in Escape from Tarkov's history, highlighting not only the major changes to the game itself, but also the evolution of the players inhabiting the world. The tactics, metas, exploits, bugs, and more. For many of us veterans, this will hopefully be a nostalgic trip down memory lane, remembering the good old days of one of our favorite games of all time. For what will likely be the majority of folks watching this video today, newcomers to the Tarkov scene, I'm hoping that this will be an entertaining and enlightening look into just how much the Escape from Tarkov experience has changed over the years. Knowing the history of the game and those that have been playing it for so long, the struggles many of us once had, the things we took for granted back then, as well as the things that new players take for granted today, will hopefully provide some well-needed context that everybody in the community can benefit from. Finally, this video is also, in many ways, a deeply personal one. As much as I tried, I couldn't help but let my experiences throughout my years playing the game color this commentary. For better or worse, the game I started playing a few years back is not the game that we all play today. It's nearly impossible to separate the changes that I've personally experienced since I began playing the game to the changes undergone by the developers, the game they're making, and the community that loves to hate it. Rather than try to provide a sanitized historical accounting of Tarkov's timeline, I decided that this would really only work out the way I was hoping if I leaned into that, trying my best to convey the feelings, the tone, the experiences, and the memories that I've also had along the way. This is the history of Escape from Tarkov. I hope you enjoy. In order to fully understand the history of Escape from Tarkov, we need to go back. Way back. Over a decade to 2010. A small Russian dev team known as Absolute Soft began work on a free-to-play, browser-based first-person shooter that would eventually come to be known as Contract Wars. Contract Wars featured a handful of game modes, over a dozen maps, in-depth character and weapon customization, achievements, skill trees, and more. It also served as our introduction to the universe of Russia 2028. In a contemporary setting in the fictional special economic zone of Norvinsk, which serves as the economic bridge between Europe and Russia, we find ourselves embroiled in political scandal and economic collapse, hitting the province's major city center of Tarkov the hardest. It's believed that the origin of the conflict that sent the area plunging into its political and economic collapse can be traced back to a number of key players, the most notorious of which is known as Terra Group Labs. 
a transnational holding company that officially deals in scientific research concerned with biotechnology that's been linked to countless illicit activities across the region. United Security, more commonly referred to as USEC, was employed by Terra Group Labs as a security subcontractor with the mission to destroy the potential evidence that would link the corporation to the illegitimate activities in the area before it could be collected by an opposing private military contractor company. The Battle Encounter Assault Regiment, known as BEAR, was comprised mainly of ex-Special Forces officers from all over the former Soviet Union. They were secretly hired by the Russian Federation government as a countermeasure against Terra Group and the activities they were allegedly taking part in. The armed conflict that would result from these two opposing factions exacerbated by the unsavory activities of the local scavengers that remained in the area, is what would ultimately lead to the total downfall of the region. Contract Wars served as our introduction to the world of Russia 2028, and its development would be pivotal in shaping the future of other games, such as Escape from Tarkov and Hired Ops. We learned quite a bit from our experience at Absolute Soft. Not only did we gain critical knowledge and understanding of first-person shooters, but we also developed a deep understanding of Unity and its systems. This allowed us to begin Escape from Tarkov with an amazing foundation of both design and technology, and we're fortunate to get to focus on creating exactly the hardcore games that we love so much. Enter Hired Ops. Absolute Soft began development on Hired Ops, the sequel to Contract Wars, sometime between 2012 and late 2016, when it would eventually be released on Steam Early Access. This period of time is where things get a bit convoluted, and much of the details seem to have been lost in translation somewhere along the way. I came across a Facebook post from the developers of Hired Ops, and it might give us a bit of insight into the state of affairs during this period of time. Why is Battlestate Games not the Hired Ops developer? who is behind Absolute Soft. Absolute Soft is the name of our company. We are the Hired Ops project developer as well as Contract Wars and have no connection to Battlestate Games. Some members of the Battlestate Games have previously worked in Absolute Soft or cooperated with us remotely. However, at the moment, the only thing our projects and companies have in common is a common Russia 2028 setting. So, what does that mean? Your guess is as good as mine. Now let's fast forward to 2015. Exit somewhere there. Hurry up, John. Wasting time. Okay, done. After the cinematic announcement trailer in late 2015, the FPS gaming community's curiosity had been piqued. Over the next few weeks, the game's press would be speculating on all sorts of aspects of the game, digging into the development team at Battlestate Games, reportedly containing members with resume line items as illustrious as Stalker, Mass Effect, and Bioshock. 
Anticipated to be something of a crossover between The Division, Stalker, and DayZ, it was advertised as a hardcore action RPG simulator in a contemporary Russian setting. It goes without saying that we were quite excited to see what was to come from this still relatively obscure Russian dev team. It wouldn't be long after the initial cinematic trailer came out that a pre-alpha gameplay trailer would be released. Two days before Christmas, we were treated with an early present. One more sneak peek of gameplay, this time showcasing the in-game inventory and looting systems. A few days later, Battlestate updated their website to include a number of incredible screenshots of gameplay, as well as posting a handful of answers to some of their most frequently asked questions. Will Tarkov be free to play? No, a purchase is required. There's not going to be microtransactions in the game, but they do intend to release paid DLCs later on. When and where is Escape from Tarkov set? Tarkov takes place in an alternate universe around our present time in a fictional Russian city called Tarkov, a northern industrial and financial center of Russia and its suburbs. The game takes place in the Russia 2028 universe. The city of Tarkov is caught in the plight of war between two private military companies, triggered by illegal activities of the Terra Group Transnational Corporation. For reasons yet unknown, the situation in the city quickly went out of control and the local populace was evacuated. The only ones left behind were private military contractors and the local scavengers, shady characters of unknown origin and allegiance. What kind of RPG elements does Tarkov have? Tarkov contains an inventory system, leveling and character skills upgrading systems. New levels will be gained by acquiring new experiences in combat, looting, healing, exploration, lockpicking, etc. The skill upgrade system in Tarkov was said to closely resemble that of the Elder Scrolls, with skills being upgraded by repeating the same action and player stats affected by learning. Some skills and stats include intellect, lockpicking with multi-tools, repairing weapons, and researching items. With every skill upgrade, the player discovers new tactical opportunities and the stats maxed at the top give access to elite skills. Players will also forget skills that are not used for too long. How realistic is the game? The team at BSG loves hardcore and realistic games, so naturally they wanted to make EFT as realistic as possible in all aspects. Health, combat, inventory management, character interaction, graphics, sound, and more. Your character can fall victim to a number of hazardous influences such as wounds, infections, dehydration, starvation, and so on. 
can also be affected by hypothermia, concussions, and obfuscations. Players will have to use the correct medications at the right time, load weapons manually, and use them carefully to avoid jamming. What engine does Tarkov run on? At this time, the game is based on Unity 5, but many essential functions were created by us from scratch. Do you plan any cross-platform or console support? We plan on a Mac release, but it's yet unclear if Mac players will play with everyone else on common servers. And we're considering a console version, but it's too early to talk about that now. February of 2016. Still in the pre-alpha stage of development, Battlestate releases their inaugural video development diary, giving us an unprecedented look at the behind-the-scenes world of the creation of Escape from Tarkov. giving us a small glimpse into the insane attention to detail that goes into all of the modeling and animation required to bring Tarkov to life. Alexander, aka Kiba, dives into the different gun states, interactions, and corresponding procedural animations that go along with each, some of which we would unfortunately not see fully implemented in the game some five years later, as well as many of the aspects of player and environmental interaction that make Tarkov gunplay so unique. I've made it into the team three years ago, literally just walked in from the street without any game development experience whatsoever and filled the position of apprentice 3D modeler. Half a year and several roughly modeled weapons later, guys on the team suggested me to try animating the weapons. Of course, if you look at the first gun I tampered with, it's gonna make me cry. However, a hundred guns later, both of my own and fixed after my predecessors, there are some things to be proud of. I've come up with plenty of ideas and features I'd like to introduce. And Escape from Tarkov is the perfect playground for this. It's a real paradise for any weapon enthusiast. Me and my colleagues are facing a real chance of setting a new bar for weapon implementation in games. Our goal is maximum realism in weapon handling. Naturally, we've got to have some props close at hand of all possible kinds, from toy guns to real military training hardware. And since it's meant for training, we are free to wear it out with no load work to our heart's content right in the office. We have to understand how to bring the mag to the base, how to release the slide stop quickly, and how much force to apply to do it. You have to know your tools in and out to understand what it can do and what is just plain impossible. The traditional approach to animations and shooters was unacceptable. We had to build a whole system which would cover all possible aspects of weapon handling. Talking about other shooters generally, every weapon has four or five animations. Pull it out, shoot, reload, fall or not, and if we're lucky, an idle animation. In our case, however, the very same weapon will need ten times more animations, with all of them divided into segments and adjusted appropriately for smooth transition of one into another in numerous possible combinations. Moreover, all of them should run smoothly, sharply and, most importantly, not arbitrarily. Eventually, the system grew up to be what we have now. Briefly, just briefly, it's drawing weapon, zeroing, shooting, ejecting magazine, inserting magazine, fast drop of the magazine, ejecting the old mag with the new one in hand, releasing side stop, if there is one, in the, if there isn't and there is no cartridge in the chamber, cocking the receiver, removing misfired cartridge, removing jamming or stovepipe, switching fire mode controller, weapon idling and a dozen more animations that are either absent in other games or made rather... Two months later, in May of 2016, everybody that purchased the Edge of Darkness edition, as well as a select few who purchased the Left Behind and Prepare for Escape editions, were granted access, under NDA, to the closed alpha of Escape from Tarkov. At this point in the development of the game, two locations were available for players to explore, Customs and Factory. Just over 10 firearms were available for use, and no armor or skills had been implemented at this point. Later in that year, December of 2016, Version 0.1 of Escape from Tarkov would mark the beginning of the extended alpha phase, and along with it came the addition of a new location, Woods, and most importantly, the lifting of the NDA. This video from Jack Frags is one of the earliest videos to come out during this period. Guys, I think I just shot my pants. I'm gonna test out grenades. I just wanna see what happens. 
Ready? Oh, the light flickers and everything. We're making a pile of bodies here, guys. <laughs> fucking hell. I think those two were AI. Holy shit, the sounds, guys. They're so scary. Okay, he's dead. There's a confirmed kill right there. What did he have? Just a pistol. Hit him a couple times. Reload. He might be bandaging right now. Or did I kill him? I think I might have killed him. Let's go see if we got him. Yeah, we got him. I actually shot him through the fence panel there. That's cool. So the game's got bullet penetration. Oh, hello. What is that? Oh. <coughs> Check this out, man. This is so cool. The amount of modding you can do on the weapons. All these different sights you can put on. Hand guards. Kind of hard to see for that scope. Yes. <laughs> the sound is amazing. Sounds really, really cool. The detail on the guns as well. Here we go. I think this is an exit. But you could. There's nothing stopping someone just camping this. They could very easily do that. But we actually managed to survive that one and we got a couple bits of loot out of it. Definitely some XP there as well. What the fuck, guys? I'm sure there's going to be many bugs in this game. Is it another swim bar? Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to join a PvP game. Should we take an AK in? That's, that looks pretty dope, doesn't it? Oh my god, it's night time and I don't have night vision. <laughs> I don't have a flashlight. Oh, I do have a flashlight. Yes. Can I even get over that fence? <gasps> I see someone. I think I killed him, guys. I think I killed him. Yes. Hold on. I'm going to turn my flashlight off before I do this. Here we go. Search. Oh my god, dude, that scared the shit out of me. Holy shit. Oh, where did he come from? It is night time. But this time, I've got night vision goggles. I feel like in this game, patience is going to be key though. Like, it's going to reward camping heavily. Because <laughs> you die really quick. Oh my god. Yo, that guy came out of nowhere. Oh man, that was spooky. This just goes on forever. There's a fucking petrol station here. Can I go inside the petrol station? Oh my god. Seven months later, in July of 2017, marked the beginning of the open beta with version 0.2. For the first time, cash flow to and from traders was now being tracked. And at this point, the game included the initial five traders of prep war, therapist, skier, peacekeeper, and fence. New loyalty levels were added to all the traders, and repair and insurance costs for each trader would go towards their loyalty. With the initial addition of quests, 
Your reputation with each trader could also be affected by the outcome of these quests. The addition of a new location, known as Shoreline, also came with Patch Point 2 as well, although initially it only included the areas between the tunnel and the river, with access to the resort fenced off. Point 2 also saw the addition of a new gun, the PP-19 Vityaz 9mm submachine gun. Let's take a moment and look at some of the gameplay that folks that were playing during the time of 0.2 would have experienced. Um, the concept... The concept is... Right now in this raid, you're dropped into a map and you've got to survive. If you survive, you get... and you exit... You get all the loot. But in the meantime... There is no HUD. It's meant to be... it's designed that way. We're just trying to stay alive here. I've seen a lot of comments and people are kind of confused. What's actually going on in this game? What do you do? You know, is it is it a campaign game? Uh, I've seen all sorts of stuff. So firstly, here's my quick little phrase, which I thought of. I would call this game a multiplayer match based survival shooter. And that sounds kind of like a, a whole bunch, but I will explain. There's people, oh, people creeping around. So it's my understanding there's real players in this game as well as NPCs, I see. Hey, get here. I, I don't know. I, I'm trying to stay alive here. <laughs> Why did... Things are pretty freaking intense. We saw our first dude. Oh, oh. We have nothing. We, we lost everything. But that's not going to stop us from redialing it back up. Welcome to Escape from Tarkov. Tip number one is going to be focusing on the trading system. Whenever you get Escape from Tarkov, you have access to a lot of different traders, and it can be overwhelming to know which traders have what and which trader you should be focusing on first. However, there are also AI-controlled scavengers that are actually super duper tough, and they are uh, really, really hard to fight. Match-based means it's similar to something like Counter-Strike or Call of Duty. You are joining a match. You aren't just joining a server, you're joining a match. So if we enter back in as our main character, we're gonna go back into the, the factory. There's some other options. We could go to the woods, we could go to custom. Why don't we try out the woods? But this raid time is 100 minutes. Uh, your goal isn't even to shoot for the head in Escape from Tarkov against an armored target. It's actually going for the legs because shooting the legs is completely soft. There's no armor there and you can kill an opponent simply by shooting their legs. It also cripples your opponent and limits their movement, forcing them to use medication to resolve their issue. And in some cases where uh, a player picks up a defender or a kiffer, let's say as a scav or as somebody with like a macro or shotgun, they may not have the medical supplies to deal with the problem and succumb to their wounds. I really can't think of any other game that's anywhere near as close to reality with gun modification and all that than Escape from Tarkov. Like really, there is no game where you can swap out grips, swap out charging handles, stocks, forends, everything. You can do it all. We can play as a scab, which I think may be a little bit more egregious to us. So I think when you play as a scab, you get some gear. Um, but you're, oh, no servers for us. So what else do we have on ourselves? What is this? A medikit vest, one clip. What is that? Bandies, a tea bag. <laughs> All right. I like it. We have some notes, no active tasks. Okay. Let's go kill some people. It's real. it's not just dirt. Excuse me? Oh, whoa, whoa. I don't know who that was, but they just ate it. The other thing is when you kill people and when you kill scavs, you also gain experience. And that's very important too, because as you level up in the game, you unlock higher level traders. Now traders sell lots of stuff that you need. They sell ammo, magazines, weapons, attachments, backpacks, armors, the list goes on. You need it all really for endgame. 
And so, yeah, you can focus on that. In my opinion, you should be focusing on skier, also known as pusher, also known as Christmas Putin. Your objective is very simple. It's to get better guns, but you can go about doing that in many different ways. So for example, you could focus on killing the AI scavs and you know, they can sometimes drop really good guns. I've heard of one guy that had an SV-98 on him. That's a very nice sniper rifle. But at level two, you'll be able to buy the soft armor vest, the PAKA, and also a Kiver helmet, which is one of the most important tools in Tarkov. You'll be finding that you'll get one shot headshotted by the scavs like auto aim style all the time. So getting access to the Kiver helmets is pretty critical to your survival. Get glasses. A mask. What did he have in his vesti? Nothing. Yeah. Ooh, check that. Give us those shells, buddy. <laughs> it's killer be killing this cruel world, my friend. Someone's walking around. Take this too. Take it all. Oh, it's. Ah. Uh. There was definitely a lot of grinding I had to do to get to where I am. You know, I'm, I'm level 32, I think. It took a, probably probably a week or something. Why can't we put it in our backpack? Put these in our pockets. This is very cool. Put those in here. You can't put it in there? What kind of trash is it? Oh, there we go. Put it on your back. Oh, no worries, Dan. All right. Tip number four is going to be focusing on selling loot and inventory management. Uh, some of you guys might already know this if you have access to the game, uh, but for some of you newbies out there, this is a really awesome tip to help you maximize your cash flow whenever you're doing your raids. You can put vests inside of backpacks loaded with supplies to save inventory space, and you can also put other backpacks inside of backpacks as well, so you can sell them to skier and pusher to maximize your efficiency while doing your raids. But yeah, it's it's really fun. I totally love it. It has its problems. You know, the game is super laggy sometimes. It's really, really annoying. The servers are bad sometimes, and this was an issue long ago, and it seemed like they fixed it, but uh, honestly, it doesn't look like it. They got work to do, and I they seriously, they got to step up their game on the servers. Scavs right now are pretty much aimbot whenever you're directly in front of them. It can be very difficult, and on maps like the factory, even 20 yards away, they can snap shoot you and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It, it will be changed in the future and that's just the way it is, but the difficulty is there and sometimes it can actually be pretty entertaining too to have AI enemies that can just absolutely destroy you. It's, it's actually a good thing that we fear the scavs rather than have them too easy. I would like to take the mask. Take off the baklava of shame. Put that on, please. Unequip. No free room for that. Got it. Sorry, buddy. Welcome to the real world. For those of you that are relatively new to Tarkov, many aspects of the gameplay from the early days might have been surprising to you. Even veterans who cut their teeth on early beta Tarkov gameplay forget so many of the past aspects of the game that defined it during each of the major eras that comprised its short history. While it's tempting to look back on the past only through the lens of rose-colored glasses, soaking up the nostalgia and reminiscing about the good old days before this patch or that meta, we don't want to forget all of the challenges, frustrations, and anguish that we experienced along the way and that the developers and the community have lived through and overcome. So much of Tarkov is taken for granted by so many in the community, and there can very often be a major divide between veterans and the newer generation of players that have all fallen in love with the game. This divide is largely due to two things. First, we've all fallen in love with Tarkov, but the Tarkov that many of us fell in love with in the past is in many ways a completely different game than Tarkov that people are falling in love with now. What we all need to realize is that for all of the infinite versions of Tarkov we all know and love and hate, None of them is what Tarkov is actually going to be. That vision is in Nikita's head, the implementation is in the hands of the developers, and the experience, feedback, constructive criticism, and open-mindedness is in the hands of us, the community. The more we can learn about the history of Tarkov and its development, 
the better informed and equipped we'll all be in discussions and theory crafting going forward. We've only covered a tiny fraction of the history of Tarkov thus far, much more is yet to come. The remainder of this series will be dedicated to every major patch starting with 0.3 in late 2017 to Tarkov as it is today. Every major milestone along the way will be covered, from the addition of new maps and expansions, the introduction of new traders, significant changes to core mechanics of the game, quests and balancing, game-changing features and metas, hilarious bugs introduced and fixed, frustrating exploits taken advantage of and patched, notable events, controversy, memes and moments you won't want to miss. I can't wait to share the rest of this project with you all. If you guys want to support me in my efforts to make the best content that I can for you all, please consider supporting me on Patreon. We have a special patrons only channel in my discord that I try to be active in every day. I give patrons early access, sneak previews of my upcoming content, engage in Q and A's and polls to gauge interest on topics and content ideas and more. It really does make a huge difference and my wife and kitty would greatly appreciate it as well. To all of you that are already supporting me on Patreon, you're all legends. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.